And yeah, here we are live again. Just again, but I am joined by my favorite person in the world, Mr. Benjamin Nowak. Finally, he's back. Finally, we get a full blown Alex Rudd live stream with my buddy Ben. We're going to discuss winter fishing and just hang out and discuss whatever else happens to come up as well. Talk about some new electronics to hit the market. Talk about making money. No, we're not really going to talk about that. Maybe dealing some drugs. No, we're not also going to talk about that either. Um, we're going to talk about Ben's day job. Immediately, immediately demonetized within the first yeah. five, uh, 30, 40 seconds immediately. Listen, these things get demonetized anyway, like right off the back. So I just go ahead and just say whatever I need to say to make everybody mad on YouTube and get them to go ahead and report it or do whatever they need to do. I told a guy to suck it right off the back first thing last week and – you know he reported it before he left. So, yeah. Here we are, though. I'm excited. Are you excited, Ben? Because I'm excited. Yeah? I am. I am. If you hear a baby crying in the background, that's just my new life. Um, so, that's just the way that things are going to go tonight. Hey, man, and that's okay because that's real life. Like, that's what I would tell anybody. Like, you're going to tune into an Alex Rudd live stream. You're getting real life. You're getting real people. And, you know, like, real people aren't pretty, and they have babies, and things break, and people cry, and that's just – all kinds of stuff. So yeah, the leg is uh, it's there. It's doing good. Went back to the doctor yesterday. Um, positive outlook is I'm in a boot now. I'm still uh, completely non weight bearing for at least six weeks, um, and then I'll probably be in a boot for another six weeks after that. So looking at about twelve weeks before it's all said and done. Got to do all the the therapies and whatnot and get it going in the right direction, but. I'm in a boot. It's not hurting too bad. It just sucks to try to get up and move around and do absolutely anything. And like, that's what I tell everybody. Like, you know, go try to take a poop with one leg. It is, it is not fun. It's not. I mean, it's just, you know, that's real life problems right there. Yeah. Like, what do you do when Bethany leaves? Do you like hobble there? Do you like crawl to the bathroom? Yeah. So I, I crutch in there and then it's like this dance to get down on the toilet. You know what I mean? And then, but once you're there, you're good, you know? And then, it just sucks. Just everybody try. Pick your dominant leg. Take it completely out of the equation next time you take a poop and just see what happens. It's a pretty interesting experience. My favorite thing with the leg so far is there's two there's two times of people, two types of people when it comes to the leg. It's the, oh yeah, I twisted my ankle one time. Or on the opposite side, it's Oh yeah, I got in a car wreck one time and crushed every bone in my body. I remember how bad it was. So it's like the people who like try to sympathize by telling you an injury not as bad, or the people who try to like one up you and tell you an injury that was twice as bad. And I'm just somewhere caught in the middle of being grateful that I didn't snap anything worse than I snapped it. So, but yeah, it's all good. Legs getting better. Legs and then there's better. Herb Brooks who basically says, uh, "Yeah, bruise on the legs, a damn long way from the heart." Yeah, yeah, there is. That's a hockey reference, a hockey movie. I I love that so much. It's the best. I love that we were sending hockey scenes from movies back and forth to each other the other day, and I know nothing about hockey. And the only scene I could think of was from, what's the movie called? Slapshot. Slapshot. Also also a great movie. Also a great movie. Yeah. When he's singing the national anthem, I try to listen to the anthem. I love that. That is one of my favorite that is one of my favorite parts of any movie ever. After they have the absolute knockdown draw out, like brawl out in the middle of the ice. I love it. But yep. yeah, so here we are. Ben, how are you doing, buddy? Things are great, dude. You know, dealing with a kid, which is phenomenal. I say dealing with, but it's really like a good thing. Like I would never trade it for the world. So have a baby now. Um, been catching some big smallmouth, working a full time job, and just really enjoying life. So I can't complain about anything, dude. Like life is really good. You need to drink some more milk, Mister Rudd. Yeah, that's what I tell you the other day. We were talking about the last time you broke your foot, dude. I remember you you were gonna do like thirty days of December, and then you broke your foot like a damn twig, idiot. Yeah. Now I, I do. My calcium's good. I take vitamin D every day, which also helps with bones. I take a multivitamin. Um, it's just the fact that I'm six three and two hundred and thirty pounds, and when I go four foot in the air and then four foot back down, and then a boat meets me on the way back up, it it sucks. You know, in a it normal sucks. in a normal experience, I would be like, yeah, Alex, it was probably not like a five or ten foot wave. It was probably like a three footer. But dude, you've been in big waves, so now you know how to measure them. Yeah, they were big. I mean, the worst part was when we got back to the to the dock and the guy goes, I'll be honest, if you boys weren't with us today, we probably wouldn't have gone out that far. And I was like, <laughs> hold up, wait a second, stop. 
So like, oh, what, what? But yeah, it's whatever, man. I mean, it's broke now. That's the way that it is, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's the way it is, though. You always push the limit a little bit when you want to like put someone on fish. Exactly. Oh, dude, that's the hardest part about actually going out with someone is like that pressure you have to go out and catch fish, right? Like I know you've experienced it with me even in the boat. Yeah. Like when you come up here, there's always this like nervousness or anxiousness to actually get out and start catching fish yeah. and then we'll catching and even if fun. it doesn't matter at all yeah like, yeah it doesn't it doesn't uh, matter like you and yeah. i could have the most fun time ever in the world not catching yeah. them but like yeah until you just catch a couple and like validate their trip you kind of yeah. push the envelope a little bit yeah and we push each other like when i'm up there like this past year when I, when we went in that one like little inlet and caught all those largemouth and like finally just put a bunch of fish in the boat we oh, were yeah. like everything it was, changed. Like a, it was it was a sigh from, of relief from there on like we'd struggled we, and struggled we tried to force it and we tried to go do the spawning bass thing and chase the free spawners and like sucked and then yeah. we just went and caught some largemouth which we knew we could have done anywhere yep and then from there dude we just hammered rolling. hammered yeah, down rolling. it's just confidence but i think it just gets you rolling you know what i mean and once you get rolling you're good but well, good. I'm glad you're here with me. I'm glad that we get to finally do a live stream together and hang out and do it's all that. It's been a long but time. It has been a long time. It's been uh, too long. We're going to try to get these things going again, get them rolling, because I'm going to try to do lives. I, I like doing lives in the winter because it gets dark early, so I have nothing else to do, you know what I mean, except for hang out and do the live streams you know, on Friday nights. And so we're going to get them rolling again. Sean, thank you for the $10, buddy. I really appreciate it. That's, that is really awesome. You do not have to do that. So anyway, let's, uh, let's formally get this thing started and start it like we do every single live stream slash podcast that I do and do a little monster bass ad and then we'll get rolling right into it. So as always guys, welcome back. What's up? Thank you for tuning into another live stream slash podcast podcast for you guys that are listening to this on podcast form it's a live stream that i do on my youtube channel usually every friday night we usually get it going and rolling and try to do it every friday night but it's random i, I pull audio from all kinds of things and make it into podcasts but thank you for you guys that are tuning in you guys come on over to my youtube channel if you've not already hit that subscribe button i'll let you guys know when i do all my live streams when i put out all my videos and stuff like that but before we get any further into today's podcast slash live stream thing i want to let you know guys know that it is sponsored by monster bass for you guys that don't know what monster bass is it is a subscription based company and once a month we're going to send a box full of tackle straight to your front door now i know what you're thinking i know what all these people over here in the comment section is thinking ben's sitting there thinking it i can hear bobby up in the front of the house he's thinking it too and he's thinking man i've tried the subscription boxes i didn't like them i thought they sucked i just got a bunch of baits i could never use but what's cool about monster bass is it's not a brand new idea to the market but the way that we are approaching the idea is really cool and new and innovative and what we're doing is we're working with pros local guides and YouTube guys like us who have our ear to the ground of fishing are out there fishing different bodies of water. We're working with those guys to handpick baits that come in a box every single month. So what that means is you're going to get the baits for the region of the country that you live in as well as the time of year that you're fishing. So that means you're getting baits for where and when you fish so that you can go out and you can catch fish. Just a great way to... I see a baby toy there. It's a great way. It's a great way to broaden and deepen your tackle box and just give you guys some more tools to use. So if that sounds interesting, if I could speak English, if that sounds interesting to you, I've got a code down below. It is S A B E 15. That's save 15. Get you $15 off your first monster bass box. Go down there, use that code. You will get 15 dollars off and we also have the added benefit of here very soon. We're going to actually quit shipping it in a box and start shipping it in a bag. So every single month, you won't just get a paper box that you're going to throw away and it's going to go in the landfill and cause a bunch of pollution and unneeded waste. You guys are going to get a nice zipper bag that you can reuse, put plastics in, put baits in, and go out and do all kinds of stuff. But here we are. Let's get going. And um, yeah. Hey, let me clarify on one point. Someone uh, said that they live in Cali and got a box designed by you. Nope, your sticker was just in that box. You're not that cool. You don't get to design the box for California. Yeah. Um, sorry, dude. Sorry to take the wind out of yeah, your sails. Yeah, but. you just got my sticker. And if the card accidentally may have had my picture on it, um, we actually had some cards get into the West box that were supposed to be in the Southeast box. 
it's not us. Rick's not packing every box, so don't get mad at Rick. And I know. Email. I'm just joking. You but listen, here's the I'm best just part. Joking, dude. So, so I just got to take the wind out of Alex and say, you got to understand Alex and I, like, if you don't know who I am, like, we're best friends, and if we, we just give each other crap all the time. Well, here's the best part about Monster Bass. So Bethany works for Monster Bass now. For all the people who didn't know that, she works there. So if you email Monster Bass to customer service, there's a good chance that you're going to run into Bethany, my wife. Well, I am privy to a lot of the uh, complaints, we'll say, that come in. And you would be amazed of how many people attack Rick directly that, like, Rick is, like, the one that screwed the box up. Like, he's packing every single one. It's pretty funny. And you know what? I tell Bethany, I'm like, blame him. Blame the blame the SOB. It is his fault. Let him take the brunt of it. It's it's great. So, but yeah. That's fair, dude. That's, that's really fair. I mean, Rick's a man. He's the packer. He's the videographer. He's everything. The he's the, yeah, he's the man. I mean, Rick. Rick is Monster Bass. You know what I mean? We yeah. did. We are just. We we're just pawns in his grand game of chess. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> but anyway. So um, let's get into this, Ben. I, I want to talk about some winter fishing, buddy, uh, and kind of talk about what you've been doing when winter starts. Like when like lakes start freezing, when you really start considering like, hey, I'm done and like kind of what you do up until that point of <laughs> doneness in the year. Yeah, there's no doneness for me unless I can't get on the water. So like my doneness and Kylie had this question earlier. She's like, when are you going to be done fishing? Like, when are you done? Mm-hmm. I'm fishing on Saturday. The high is 34 degrees. But until I can't get my boat through the skim ice by the ramp, like I'm not done. So like wow. I won't. I won't stop fishing until there's ice on the lake, which I don't know if that's smart or stupid, like both from a boat maintenance perspective, but also from like a sanity perspective. Um, But for me, winter really starts like when that water gets to like low forties and below, like mid to low forties and below. And that's what I'm going to start looking for those fish to be pushing and pushed out to their deep wintering spots, like off the breaks and that deep water on those deep flats. Yeah. Um, and that really, for me, is when like winter starts. So low forties yeah. and below. Gotcha. But and then now, it was different for you too, right? Like when yeah, does it start it, for you? Say so like winter for me starts as soon as that water dips below fifty five, right? That's when I really consider like late fall winter fishing has started, right? And a lot of it has to do with the fact that my lakes get drawn down really hard, right? And so, you know, you got these huge drawdowns, lakes get drawn down 25, 30 feet. It concentrates a lot of these fish up shallow. I can start cranking. I can start throwing a jerk bait. I can start power fishing. Is there a baby coming? I want to see the baby. And start doing like the whole winter fishing thing, what I consider winter fishing. Look at that precious soul. That is Miss Reese right there. And she is making her grand debut on the YouTube. Dude, look at those eyes. Look at how Hi, baby. Look at the blue eyes. Oh, <laughs> she, she is, is so cute. tired. Did she, uh, fortunately, doesn't look like you too much. That's I good. know, dude. Thank God. But she's already got more hair. Yeah, she does. It grew in. It, I told you, man, it was just going to grow in the way that it went out on you. And it looks so good. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. Man. What a beautiful baby. What a beautiful baby. He is cuter than a butt. Um, but anyway, where were we? We were talking about winter fishing. Talking so, winter fishing. So tell me, like, what do you consider winter baits? Like, what's your, like, go-to winter style? Because what you were doing in your video that you put out the other day was pretty interesting. Yeah. Like, so let's talk. There's about some it. there's some weird stuff we do. For me, like the blade bait is my number one. Like the blade bait is my all time favorite winter bait. It's basically a hard body lure that isn't going to have like a lot of natural action when it's sitting on the bottom, and it's got a little piece of metal on it or lead on the metal. Um, it's it's a good cold water bait because there's not like a lot of accessory action. Like it's not going to do a lot of stuff when it's sitting still. So mm-hmm. a blade is number one. Uh, a small tube, like a little two and three quarter inch tube with mm-hmm. a standard like three eighths ounce or a quarter ounce head on there, mm-hmm. a small swim bait, and then like a jerk bait. And I'll throw a crankbait a little bit, but for me, like I'm typically slowing down this time of year and I'm fishing like smaller, no action, like dead action sort of baits. Like I'm and not a lot really of that has to crankbait. do, that has to do with just the way your lake set up too. Like you don't got a lot of pranking water well, per se, right? it does but it's also like where i'm talking like low 40s and below like you're talking like mid 50s and below yeah yeah 
Exactly. Exactly. And see, for me, you know, obviously during the drawdown, you know, the coldest my water will get is about 45. Like that's really the coldest that my water will get. And then, you know, for the most part throughout the winter, I'm going to have water anywhere between 45 and 50. And we'll have a, you know, a week or two stint where the water is going to be in the, the low 40s, maybe topping out in the high 30s. And very rarely does that happen. And so unlike Ben, you know, I can go out, I can crank a crankbait. I can focus on those shallow water areas. I can be more of a power fisherman where Ben's got to be a little more passive. Throw those baits that are a little less aggressive and stuff like that. And so, you know. Okay, she's going also, back to bed. Sorry, she's going bye, back to bed. Bye, baby. Bye. I see you later. Yes, and now she's drooling. Oh, I know. It. <laughs> Look at her. She is so fascinated. She's like, hmm, lights. Okay. That's sorry. so funny. You're good, man. All right. But anyway, um, so yeah. But like now, when you are talking about winter fishing, are you focusing on largemouth, smallmouth? Nah, dude. Like largemouth for me, when it gets below 55, it gets really, really tough. Like largemouth are very oh, yes. um aware of like cold water situations and they don't like to move a lot super lethargic smallmouth are willing to bite they're willing to feed pretty much all winter long um yeah. largemouth get a lot tougher to catch for me so really smallmouth deep water hard bottom areas where there's a ton of bait fish you know and the thing is is what's fascinating to me is like it's the same way down here and you've seen it you know you've been down here and seen it where like there's a point in the winter in which the smallmouth just become easier to catch you know they move up they start to use that shallow water more i can power fish for them more and a lot of these clear highland reservoirs that i like to focus on in the winter like the smallmouth literally move up and take the largemouth's place and the largemouth just they just disappear i really i honestly don't know where they go if i if i could figure out where they live and you know you'll catch them intermittently you know you catch them mixed up but we went fishing one day down here it's like february i think and like we went down a bank and I told you, so when we go back down this bank, smallmouth will have replaced all those largemouth. And sure enough, they replaced every one of those largemouth. And I mean, it's just fascinating. Which is weird to me because like, dude, I think those fish literally, you caught the smallmouth out of the area and the largemouth were like sitting nearby. But because they're so much less aggressive, like they're not mm -hmm. going to attack that bait or they're not going to beat the smallmouth to that bait. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, I think those smallmouth are going to be way more aggressive. They're going to attack your bait a lot sooner. And those largemouth are just going to be like, oh, well, nothing here to take my spot. So I'm just going to take it back. Exactly. Exactly. And it, I mean, dude, it's, it's nuts. I mean, I th I mean, it's just fascinating. I love the, I love that challenge of trying to figure out, you know, what's, what, what's going to bite, what's happening, those kinds of things. And I mean, it's just, it's cool. It's cool. Now question over in the comment section. And for you people listening on the podcast, like I said, if you if you tune in on YouTube, you get to interact with us. Um, Team Zipper Lips asked, which is, that's just an amazing username, how deep is deep? So when you say deep, what are you talking about, Ben? Like, how, how deep are you fishing? Yeah, so for me, I actually had this conversation with Nathan. I don't have a lot of confidence below, like, 32 foot of water. Like, I've just never really confidently caught them that deep. I mm -hmm. catch them a lot in, like, the mid to deep 20s but dude like we were talking and i, I talked to this guy named smallmouth um smallmouth freaks on instagram he's catching mm -hmm. them in 45 foot of water on a swim bait so my thought process is on these glacial spring-fed bodies of water which i know you don't have mm -hmm. these glacial small spring-fed bodies of water like maybe these fish are in that 35 to 45 foot on those deep flats right instead of being like on the breaks where i'm catching them now in like 22 foot of water Maybe mm -hmm. they're congregated because it makes sense if they're congregated in that 40 ish foot of water range. And that's mm -hmm. where you're going to find the groups. Cause right now we're just catching onesie twosies. We're getting like six bites a day, but they're all big. Mm -hmm. What if we can get 12 bites a day or, or 20 bites a day in that deeper water? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. And see, that's something that happens down here. You know, a lot of guys, the colder it gets, and obviously you guys, it gets drastically colder a lot faster than it does down here. And so, like, we have a period at, like, the end of February, right, that it, the water gets just cold enough that we can get on that Demiki rig bite, where those fish will be out in 45, 50 foot, heck, 65 foot of water sometimes. You drop straight down on them with what is essentially a, you know, a walleye jig. It's just a little jig head with a piece of plastic on the back. 
and you get those fish to come up off the bottom and eat. And it's one of those things like you can do it earlier in the year when the water's a little bit warmer, but it's the same deal. It's like onesie twosies, but you'll catch like really, really big ones or you'll catch really, really big stripers because the, like the smallmouth haven't moved in there. But once it gets a little bit colder, those bigger populations of fish move out deep and you can catch them doing that. And it's, you know, it's, I personally, I know you like it. You like the video game fishing. You know what I mean? You love to find them with the graph drop on. I'm sure if I was like running. Yeah, what lake did I go to last year that I was trying to do that? Um, oh, where did you go? Or- no, South Holston. No, South Holston. Did you no, go to South Holston? Yeah, no. dude, I was way up in the. I was way up in the mountains. Like, yeah, I know that's yeah. everywhere down there. But, <laughs> but no, you were way, like, way. No, no, um, no. It, where did you go? It was a, I come it was up there? Not a big lake. No, was it Boone? Did you go to Boone? No, I have no idea. I will have to figure it out later. But I did the Dimitri rig there. stuff. Yeah, and and you, I caught them pretty decent, but it wasn't right. Like it wasn't. It wasn't like you're mentioning. Like they weren't it's there not, yet. It wasn't cold enough. It just simply yeah. wasn't cold enough. Like yeah, it, was it was cold. Warm. It was like it was like nice. Yeah, yeah it was and like that's not that's not when you do Mickey Rick. Exactly. It's gotta be those like when we've had an extended period of just ridiculously cold weather that those those big concentrations of fish get out deep. Whereas for me, that's why most of the year, well, most of the winter months that, you know, that winter time that I fish, I'm fishing shallow. I'm cranking a crankbait. I'm focusing on that zero to 15 foot range of water and i'm usually throwing something moving right and i'm I'm getting those fish to react spro rock crawler fritz side uh 3xd bandit those kinds of small body crankbaits i'm dragging a lipless i'm throwing a 1.5 i'm throwing flats has all those different kinds of just reactionary style baits figuring out where they are in the column right and where they're orienting to the bank because a lot of what i'm focusing on is like those 45 degree rock slate big chunk rock banks those things are going to warm up quickly throughout the day and those fish are going to stage on and they're going to eat crawdads and bait fish and whatever happens to be living up there with them right and i just don't focus on that deep bite as much well and i think it's interesting too like deep is so relative because up here you have lakes that are very natural lakes which mean they're typically like um just dredged out by nature right or you have reservoirs which are a lot shallower bodies of water and then you have these deep glacial lakes where you just have these like moderate like maybe 100 feet sections of shallow water and then it drops off into nothingness right so you have deep water is definitely relative depending on where you're going to be fishing so exactly kind of keep that in mind too like if you're fishing a reservoir where deep is like the deepest part of the lake is 40 foot deep might be like 20 foot yeah, exactly. And like, I, you know, it's funny, you hear a lot of people talk about ledge fishing in the summer and everybody thinks ledge fishing is deep fishing, right? They, they, they call it, they literally say I'm out deep fishing. But the thing is, is most ledges are in 10 foot of water, right? And like, uh, you know, 10 to 15 foot of water. And for most of us, that's not that deep. You know what I mean? Like you could swim down to 10 feet of water, but they consider that offshore deep fishing. Now there's some ledges that are in 25, 30 feet, of course, but a lot of those like big ledges that you think about, they're in 10 to 15 foot of water. You know what I mean? It, I actually have a question for uh, Jeremy Cronkright or Conkright messages in the comments. He talks about the float and fly with your float and fly. Are you tying a loop knot to that bait? Are you tying a loop knot to that float and fly? So that way it stays horizontal. Or are you just tying like whatever knot you want? Super curious. I've seen it kind of done both ways where guys are tying a loop so it stays more horizontal and guys are tying yeah. like a standard knot and kind of brings the notes, you know. I, I mean I've always just tied a standard knot. The the little bit that I've done done it, you know, I've done it with my dad the, for the most part. He's a big like he used to go and do that and catch some big ones. Um I just tie a standard knot, you know what I mean? And, yeah, I mean, and I, catch- I'm interested too, actually from the hair jig perspective, like when you're swimming a hair jig. I really believe if you tie a loop, you're going to get a lot more free action out of that bait than if you tie direct mm-hmm. to it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So yeah. just curious. Yeah. it's a, dude, that, And that's a fun bite. I mean, it's a very interesting bite. It's a very fun bite. It's a great way to get catch giants. And it's kind of how they they got the whole idea of um, freaking whatever it's called. Where they just reel it and like hop the bait. I forgot what the crap's called. I hate it. Um, like storm baiting? No, it's like a what the heck do they call it? Yeah, tight lining. I freaking hate tight lining. And like that whole idea of it's just you're 
suspending a small, very, very small bait fish in front of these small mouth and these large mouths eyes and they want to eat it. And I mean, dude, that's what's amazing is how keyed some of those giant small mouth. I'm talking those four to five, even six pound small mouth will get keyed in on a bait that ain't no bigger than the tip of your finger. Like I don't get dude, that. I don't know how much of this conversation I can have on like YouTube yet because there's a lot of like secret stuff that Dirt and I are talking about. Yeah. But I do think that there's a big factor that plays in, into that. And like these fish are feeding on bugs a lot more than we think they are. Oh, I mean, obviously it is a cold water bait for a lot of people, but I am saying yeah. like there's yeah. some interesting perspectives on how often, you know, a float See, and I've and always, line would work. Uh, and, uh, I've always remember remember that. when you came up here and yes. we were yes. like spawn fishing, but we weren't really spawn fishing and they were eating bugs. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm curious. I'm I'm really curious how much that plays in, especially with some of the things we've been doing lately. You know, and there's a there's a buddy of mine down here, at Creek Fishing Adventures, and the dude uses little bug style baits all the time and catches hey, fish. James Howard, thank you so much for the 499 super chat, man. Yes. We didn't miss it. Um, I just saw it pop up, but thank you very much. Yes, thank you, thank you. But yeah, I mean, he uses those bug style lures all the time. I do not believe you're right. You know, I can't tell you how many times I've gone through a tunnel or something with my boat, and there's cicada um, shells all over the side of those tunnels. And I'm thinking, man, some of these have got to fall in the water. These fish have got to notice that they're there. That are like mayflies. You know, the little uh, mayfly larvae. They'll crawl up and they'll hatch out and hatch into mayflies. I mean, they have got to know those bugs are there because obviously they know the mayflies are there, right? And they eat those mayflies. I mean, I've caught six pounders that the back of their throat looks like you've painted it black because the mayflies are so packed in there. And so, I, I mean, yeah, I definitely think there's something to that that bug bot, right? <laughs> that'd be good. That'd be a good term for it. The bug bot. They get on that bug bot. Hey, really good question came in from just ask Papa. He said, all right, sir, in order, in order, which do you consider the most important in selecting bait season, water temp, water clarity, or time of day? So in the bait they're using. All of them. I like, I, I, <laughs> I simultaneously process every single one of them. Like, I really, I mean, because it all factors in. Because if if you got a fifty degree water temp, but it's chocolate milk, you probably don't want to pick up a, a translucent bait. You know what I mean? Or if it's the middle of the day, bright blue skies with milky, nasty water and a fifty degree water temp, you probably want to pick up something with a little bit of chrome in it. Um, yeah, I kind of, I, I can't. I mean, I can't say one or the other is more important to me than the other one. Like it's something that I just try to kind of just look at all at the same time and determine what I'm going to throw. Yeah. So for me, like season definitely plays in as one of the bigger factors. Like that gives me a starting point. Like I know, okay, a blade should work in what I would yeah. consider winter time. But winter time is a lot of times determined by water temp. Yeah. So like I look at water temp first, then I look at conditions to try and figure out. And then when I say conditions, I'm talking like environment. So what's the sun doing to try and figure out what kind of color to get or what kind of, you know, moving bait or a slow finesse bait. And then I go to color of the water and then I determine do I want a bright bait or translucent bait. You know what yeah. I'm saying? It's see, dude, you know, that, that's always a hard factor for me because down here, one thing that we run into all the freaking time is like the past couple of days, it's been brutally cold outside, right? We're dealing with, you know, air temps in the twenties, but our water's still in some places, high fifties, almost into the sixties. And so like, freaking i get i get in this mindset of like well it feels cold outside then i should be fishing winter style baits when in truth i need to keep my eyes on the graph and figure out what the water temperature is and fish the water temperature because regardless of how cold i am if the bass aren't cold then they're not going to eat more winter style baits um so i i would definitely say water temp for me is probably the first thing that i look at and, you know, a lot of people all the time are asking me about like electronics and graphs and do graphs and blah, blah, blah. Listen, I'm not a graph guy like Ben is. Ben is like on his graphs. He uses his graphs constantly. I mean, he's a he's a master behind them. Whereas me, I literally turn my graph on to figure out how deep I am to look at a map and to figure out what the water temperature is. And if I can figure out those three things, I feel super confident to be able to go and fish wherever I happen to be at. You know what I mean? So Yeah. 
Well, like another good question. Do you think there's a good portion of fish that stays, that stays shallow? And I don't know what shallow is, but stay shallow all year round. So Absolutely. I'm assuming open water. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Talk about like that because that's kind of like your – that's kind of like your avenue. Like that's what you enjoy doing. Exactly. See, I, I believe there are residential fish. I believe there's a there's a set of fish that no matter what happens, what goes on, they live shallow their entire life. And even if they live in a reservoir that's getting jerked up and down 25, 30 feet, they'll just follow that water down. You know, you got to realize that a fish doesn't want to move horizontally. They want to move vertically. You know, they, they don't want to move out they don't have to travel 30 or 40 or 50 or 60 yards down a bank but if they can stay in an area and simply just follow that water level down and stay in two feet the entire time that water level is dropping that's what they want to do because they don't have to expend a ton of energy they just follow that water down and so like you look at guys like john cox and keith poche i mean they've made their name and made their living fishing residential fish that never leave areas and that's kind of what I love to do too. I love to go find those fish that just live in an area and figure out how to catch those fish that just live in that area their whole entire lives. And so, yes, I believe there are fish that stay and then there's fish that move too. So I got a really unique thought when I was looking at one of the comments from Mark Thoreau. He said, my local ponds are no more, no more than nine foot deep. So as the water temp falls and you're fishing a confined pond where you're like, these fish have to be in like a one acre area or however many acre area. How do you adjust when the water temps start to fall? Like, do you slow down? Do you change your presentation? Do you like, what do you do? Like there still have to be bite windows. Like even though these fish's metabolism might slow as the, the water temps fall, like I don't even know how to adjust to that. You just kind of have to change your presentation based on what these fish are doing. You yeah. know what I'm saying? See, for me, I'm going to get them to react. Like my first instinct is is literally hit that fish's brain in a way that it can't not try to kill it. You know what I mean? And that's like the KVD approach. And that's what I love about KVD is like that man is going to power fish until his arms fall off because he knows he can get fish to react, right? And for me, I'm going to pick up a lipless, a chatterbait. I want to try to get those fish to react first. And then if I can't get them to react, then you might have to start slowing down a little bit and start really methodically picking through an area. But first thing I'm going to do is like pick up a rattle trap or something like that and just get one to react. Because if I figure out where one's at, then I know where multiple should be. Because if there's one consistency with cold water, wherever there's one, there's usually more than one. They love to group up when it gets cold and the colder it gets, the more they want to group up. And I mean, we've seen that here in Tennessee. You've seen that up in Michigan. I've seen it down in Alabama, Southern Alabama in the middle of January when I'm still getting 70 degree water temps you know, that's really cold for that place in January. And when that air temperature drops and that surface temperature drops in the morning, you know, I would find fish concentrated on reed clumps and there would be three or four sitting on one reed clump like they set up on stuff up here in the fall. And so I would just get that reaction bite and then try to pick apart a place. And you know what I found super interesting, even on really small bodies of water, is you're always looking for something that heats up or holds heat longer exactly. right so heats up faster holds heat longer i would start by looking at wood wood tends to hold heat longer it's porous it's dark and it's going to hold that heat longer your black floating floats on docks will hold heat longer mm -hmm. and then the things that heat up faster are obviously the rocks you know you've had this experience where you're fishing shale rock and you're fishing like the black shale versus the gray mm -hmm. shale or the white mm -hmm. shale, right? Like things that heat up faster or things that hold heat are going to be my main areas of focus, even when I'm fishing a very small body of water. Um, and if you're fishing down in Florida or you're fishing on a lot of grass, think about it from the perspective, okay, these reeds that are sticking out of the water are going to heat up a lot faster than maybe this grass that's submerged. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? So like, mm -hmm. look for areas that are going to hold heat, going to hold some sort of bait fish, or it's going to heat up a lot faster. Exactly. And, you know, so many people bypass that. Like, they don't take mental notes of where they're catching fish. And, like, they're like, but, man, this bank looks just like that other bank that I was fishing. But what you didn't realize is it may look the same physically, but, like, the actual material or the actual makeup of what the rock is can make a humongous difference. I mean, dude, I have seen times when they literally want to be on a dark shell kind of like slate kind of rock 
and you will literally hit a patch of it that is 20 foot wide and there'll be five bass sitting right there and then you won't get another bite for two miles until you hit another patch that's that black slate rock and it's just for the simple fact of it it warms up just a few more degrees than the rest of it right so fascinating this is something I've been wanting to talk about. And I, I read about it the other day and it just made me so happy, right? Um, someone in the comments in one of my videos was, I had mentioned the fact that bass, I believe, that their eyes don't work as well when it gets colder outside. And they had to have a rebuttal to that, you know, whatever. I, I don't care. You know, they want to go scientist to scientist with me. That's fine. But I read a lot of articles before I made that assumption. And a lot of the articles that I read had to do with saltwater fish and the fact that a lot of pelagic saltwater fish that live in deep cold water have adapted to that cold water by having a muscle behind their eyes that actually heat up their blood and pump warm blood into their eyes so that their eyes function better in colder water. And so I truly believe that like in the winter and when we're talking about winter bass fishing, I don't know if you've ever seen it, but I've seen it. I've seen bass that are literally like in a tonic state, like a catatonic state. They just sit and don't move. You can hit them. You can touch them. You could probably foul hook them if you wanted to, but I think they're like trying to warm their body up enough to get their eyes to function well enough that they can go and actually feed. And I think that's why when I talk about winter fishing, at least for me anyway, later in the day is better because a lot of these fish are using this rock and using these places, those those boat dock, those floating boat docks, those different things to warm their body up enough to get their eyes functioning enough to actually be able to eat. I also believe that's why when you're talking about like your methylates, your chartreuses, these bright colors, not only do they do really well to contrast dirtier water that we usually get in the winter, but the bass can see it really, really well, even when their eyes aren't functioning super well. That's just something... After a lot of thinking, a lot of observation of what bass do in the wintertime and things that I've noticed, that's something that I've noticed. And after I read those articles about those pelagic fish and how they actually have muscles in their eyes that warm up the blood and pump it in their eyes, I was like, man, there's got to be something to the fact of why bass actually sun themselves. I mean, it's just like a snake or anything else. They got to warm their body up. They can't regulate. They can't self-regulate like we do. Ben, you're Ben, you're talking. You're talking, but you're muted. So I literally just did research on this. Like as you were talking, yeah, I know I'm repeating yeah. myself. And uh, one of the biggest things, especially that I found, was about ice fishing. And typically, this is the cleanest water of the year. Like when it's under ice, you're not getting a lot of sediment stir up. There's no wind. There's no. Yeah. There's nothing like stirring up the water. So those fish rely almost exclu exclusively on sight, right? So one of the biggest things that we have up here is when that water gets super clear under the ice in the springtime, anytime something stirs up that water, anytime that water gets even remotely dirty and those fish are coming out of dirty water or coming out of deep water into shallow water, they have to still try to rely on sight to find that bait. And so if that water gets dirty, their eyesight's way worse. So you need to throw a bait that's a lot brighter to get those fish to react to it. There you know you go, what I'm man. saying? There you go. So like in the springtime, a lot of times you. when you're when you're fishing around super or typically dirtier water situations, you need to throw a brighter color bait to get those fish actually to recognize because their eyes are so much worse during the winter months during colder water yeah. situations. Super. See, I, I mean, it is super interesting. It's something I've been fascinated with. You know, I, I go through phases of different things that I'm fascinated with about bass, and right now it's their eyesight. And I saw it, I think, in the winter. Is, it was stuff that I wanted to experiment with until I got the old boot here. But, I, you know, but on the contrast, if you look at summer fishing, you know, when the water's as hot as it's going to be, we resort to throwing the most finesse, passive, natural-looking thing. And I think it's because those bass are just so freaking keyed up. You know what I mean? Like, they're able to dissect things a lot better. They're very keyed on what to look for, what they're trying to eat. And I think you got to get them to react to certain things like a, you know, a Cinco by not being able to see it very well. You know, they can't distinguish it as well. And so they're thinking, man, this thing's getting away from me. 
it's not going to kill me. You know, I, I'm going to take a chance on eating this. And I think that's how you trick those fish. I think in the winter, we we'll get them to react. In the summer, it's colder weather, you get them to react. Warmer weather, you get them, you trick them. And I think that's a, I think that's just a distinguished it's something that anglers need to distinguish between is tricking a bass and getting a bass to react. It's two totally different things. So yeah, I don't yep. know. Agreed. Fascinating. Agreed. Okay. So let's go on to, uh, Lawrence's new, uh, it's freaking hey, dude, scope. every, every company's new, new forward viewing sonar. It's live and scope. a lot of people will see me as being super biased on this topic, but I'm actually very excited about this. Like I hope Humminbird comes out with something relatively close because live scope or Lawrence tried to come out with it and didn't. I want them both to come out with something close to live scope because it drives innovation. It's going to drive Garmin to become better. It's going to be driving these companies to be the next innovators. And so like I saw live or I saw the new active uh, target and I saw the new mega live. I really want them to be good. Are they? I don't know. I mean, they're a little bit behind, so hopefully they are. I just wonder if, they went to Garmin and they said, all right, listen. They had to license it, dude. They absolutely they had to. It. That or they literally took a live scope transducer and tried to tried to back engineer it. I know for sure Lawrence uh, licensed the traditional pan optics technology for their original yeah. live site. I know 100% that that happened. Well, dude, it's crazy, know, man. I would have to believe it happened for this, too, because – if you look at the Lawrence transducer and you put it next to the Hummerbird transducer, they're almost identical. And then if you put it next to a live scope transducer, it's pretty similar. So you have to believe that something similar happened or, or they licensed some of that technology. Here's what I'm hoping is the, the, the advances in the technology make the price points more competitive. And we start seeing price points just kind of click down a little bit. Like that the technology may be getting a little older and you'll be able to get your hands on some of this stuff for just a little bit more affordable of a price than it's set at right now. I mean, because like if you wanted to go full blown, I mean, say you got a 10 in the front, 10 in the back, you got live scope the whole nine. I mean, you're still looking at six, seven thousand dollars in grass. I mean, it's absolutely insane. Still. Yeah. Yeah, you are. Um, I think it's insane. Like the prices overall. But I think if you look at like most technologies, that's just the way things work. Like side scan yeah. when it originally came out was absolutely insanely priced, and now like your five hundred dollar units of side scan down and yeah. exactly. whatever. I, I just think it's going to be part of that evolution. You can now get your traditional pan optics for like eight hundred dollars. So I will say this: I find it fascinating that I can buy a brand new iPhone for twelve hundred bucks, but I can't buy a fishing graph which when you look at the the actual operating system of it the os of it it's not even anywhere near the in, as advanced as say an iphone is as that's an operating system. like you have to really think about what it actually is doing inside that graph dude like the amount of data it's processing to make it look like an image and we're not talking like 2d sonar 2d sonar yeah. blows like 2d sonar is for like the most ultra basic there are times and places i still use it but like down imaging you're looking at like it taking pings and drawing the picture of a fish and yeah, super high yeah. frequency imaging right like super yeah. high frequency imaging it's just turning them into like actual pictures yeah. which it, by okay, the way yeah. hummingbird's picture is if you're looking for side imaging, yeah. If I could have, if I could have Garmin's live scope technologies, right, all their forward-facing technology with Hummingbird side imaging and Lawrence's down imaging, dude, you would have you would have the perfect graph. <laughs> I mean, like, and no wonder some yeah. of these pros are running all three, right? You know, because they want to get each part of those like those different things. So you want to talk about this because a lot of pros basically stepped away from sponsorships from electronics, right? This past mm -hmm. year you saw guys running a Lowrance and a Humbird and a Garmin because they wanted like the best of all worlds. How much do you think with these companies coming out with their new forward facing sonar, guys are going to start to say, oh, okay, I'll take a Lowrance sponsorship, even though, you know, for years they were in the past and now Humbird, I'll Man. take your money and I'll oh, run I'll your product. I'll just go ahead and tell you, I think these dudes are going to do whatever the hell they need to do to make money over the next few years. Cause I think it's going to get real, real tough for some of these boys. 
I mean, just some things that are happening in the fishing industry right now, period, with boat sponsorships and things getting thrown around yeah. and a lot of I do I think these guys, I don't care the how amount big, of pressure they're getting, the amount of pressure a lot of these guys are getting from people that decided to make a YouTube channel five years ago who are now blowing up. Yeah. There's a lot. That's why you're seeing pros start to step into it. I'm no. not worried for the guys at the top of the game. I'm not worried for the Ikes and the Skeets and the KBD and whoever else is at the top of their game. Oh, I th yeah, they're set for life. They're, they're set, right? I'm worried about the guys that are like mid-tier guys and below. Yeah. Who haven't taken a step into social media. And But, dude, there's even some of those high-level guys that – here's the telltale for me, the boat sponsorships. Just take a peruse and look at boat sponsorships. How many people are switching? How many people are getting dropped? How many people are going to these no-name companies that you have never okay. heard of before? Well, a lot of that, dude, is so political. A lot For of that sure. is based on the trail you're fishing or based on, you know, if you decided to step away from this company, sorry, boys, yeah. but you're not getting a boat next year. Like, yeah. it, it's just the way that it is. Even super high-level guys are really, you know, going to be stepping away from boat companies because they're fishing a different trail. Yeah. Insane. Insane. And I think you're going to see a lot of people switching back and forth. You know, a lot of people were saying, oh, I'm so glad that Greg Hackney's going back to the Elite Series. So glad. Just, I, dude, I think they're going to fish wherever they qualify for. I think that it, they're going to do bad in one. If they can qualify for the next one, they go right into it. You know what I mean? Like, you're going to see a lot of flip-flopping going back and forth. I think it's going to get to the point with fishing tours – that it is kind of like with professional football players and getting traded around. Obviously, it's not the same dynamic. You know, football players get traded for other teams, but you're going to see a lot of flip flopping back and forth. You know what I mean? If you were to, to design a singular pro circuit, would it be beneficial to have like a major league fishing, like a BPT style of like, okay, here's your AFC and then here's your NFC? Or, or well, like, what is baseball? Like you have your ALS and your MO or whatever, right? Yeah. Two different leagues have two different rules, but then at the end of the year, they compete against each other. Yeah. I think it would be cool. be so interesting, right? Like that way you, I, I think feel like there's this division between the two that actually drives a wedge in the sport versus like bringing people together. Yeah. Which cracks um, me up. I get, I love how pissed off people get at the other tour that they don't like. Like there's a guy that fishes around here and has an unsuccessful YouTube channel at this point, but he like gets very just torqued out of shape about the MLF. And I'm like, I, I don't like who, like who really has enough time during the day to even give a crap. Like, I, I mean, like if it's on, I'll throw it on for a few minutes, watch it. That's cool. I'm just not super highly invested into that. You know what I mean? It, it's just such a weird dynamic to see people get that pissed off about something that doesn't really even matter that much. Yeah. I mean, to me, fishing is fishing, but I think that's part of the, like part of me, I stepped away from the competitive aspect. I just don't really find that much enjoyment out of it anymore. Mm -hmm. But like, I just like watching fishing. So if MLF exactly. is on six o'clock in the evening and I can watch that, I'm like, yeah, that's sweet. It's still fishing. And that's what I love about them is when they did some of those afternoon events, that was cool. Cause I was able to come home and watch fishing. Whereas like when it's on during the day, I'm at work most days, you know what I mean? And so, so here's something, this is an interesting comment that I, I don't, I'm not, I don't know. It's not a disagree or agree, but I just think it's interesting. Um, it says unknown companies will give better deals to get known, uh, get known and get their name recognized. But with fishing anymore, I mean, I don't think that that value is there. I really don't believe the ROI of putting a boat wrap on a pro's boat and are running an ad in front of a MLF event or a Bass Masters Elite Series event is there. I have never personally. Unless, unless they actually win a tournament because of your product. I don't care if it's exactly. a boat. You're not going to sell a lot of boats. I don't so care it was like a, what's a the boy's name? Unless they win a tournament based on your product specifically, whether it's electronic, yeah. a bait, or it's a specific piece of line, I yeah. think it has to do more with, you're going to sell more product if someone wins because of your product, and you can't lie about it anymore. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and like, what was the dude? I can't, I can never remember. The guy, one chick. 
Lee Livesey. Yeah, so he was sponsored wow. by he was sponsored by Whiskey Myers, the band. And like we were talking about, and that's great. That's cool, man. I mean, like, whatever. I don't, you know, I don't care. That's great. If that's what's helping him pay the bills, live his life, that's wicked. But I was cracking up because I was like, man, this dude's sponsored by a band. Like, I'm gonna reach out to the Foo Fighters and see if they want to sponsor me. You know what I mean? Like, it no, just cracked me up. We joke about it, but that kind of obscure sponsorship caught your attention more than every other sponsor on that dude's jersey. Yeah, Think I was like going down to the sponsor list. I was like, whiskey. I was like, I've listened to their songs before. I was like, what kind of sponsorship is that? Of most of these sponsor companies, because that's the only one you can remember. Yeah. Yeah. And so maybe there is something like to the obscurity of it all, right? Like maybe the obscurity is like like is like if you are so obscure to the fishing world, you know what I mean? I was, there's another guy that's sponsored by Monster, and the only reason I know he's sponsored by Monster is because Tyler of like Stewart sponsored by okay. Monster. Yeah, I thought, man, that'd be a damn good sponsor to have. I would be like, I'd be off the walls all the time. All right, so enough about professional fishing. I just we always like to get off on a tangent about that. It's always pretty fun. I, I don't know. I, I think this is gonna be an interesting year for fishing. I think it's gonna be an interesting year, period. Um, me and Ben both know some things about the industry that is going on. Um that it's pretty crazy. Just coronavirus related. I just got demonetized because I said that. Um, amazing how you can't even say a word. Um, but um, but like just related to all that, that it's it's pretty crazy just what it's actually done to the world of production. And so yeah, it's been an interesting year. I have a really unique question that kind of came up based on um, Derry CKW. He said fishing is one of the only sports that gets sponsored by fishing only companies. It does to an extent, but my question really is how much do you think that we're losing out because there are multiple tours and there's so many like pros. And I say pros like this because we all know what that means. Yeah. That, I was actually going to talk about that a little bit because quotes, because the people that are listening on your podcast, like I'm tossing the bear quotes when I say pros. Yeah, so quote unquote pro. I, I know a bunch of quote unquote pros because they got enough money to pay the entry fees and then they slap a bunch of logos on their jerseys that they're not actually sponsored by and they go out and they go fish. Cool, whatever. I mean, you got the money, go do it. Um I, I think it I think it dilutes everything, right? It dilutes everything that we do. And we're seeing it now, even in like the whole YouTube fishing world. I mean, obviously I have a value and and we can prove our value by analytics. But I think if you're a, a young aspiring tournament angler, God forbid you're just that's horrible of life choices in my opinion. But, but if you're a young aspiring tournament angler, you the ROI for a company to actually invest into what you're doing is is not there because of how many people just can label themselves as a quote unquote pro, right? And we've had a whole podcast about this, like what actually is pro fishing? A lot of people, you know, they got somebody either backing them with a checkbook or they make enough money themselves that they just buy their way in and they, it's a pay to play kind of sport. Um, but then too, there's no value add to even like a big tour like the MLF because they're just not executing on the idea and, and executing on the actual promotion part of what they said they were going to be doing. You know what I mean? Like what is the true value of six o'clock in the morning on discovery channel on Saturday morning? I have never once watched a televised MLF event because they're on six o'clock on a Saturday morning. I'm fishing or I'm sleeping. Like I'm not going to get up to watch the MLF. So it doesn't matter how many Jack's links beef jerky commercials you run, how many Bob's machine shop, you know, sex jail, whatever. I don't care what the hell kind of, you know, product you're trying to give to me. I'm not going to be up to watch it. You know what I mean? Like I, I don't know. So I don't see with the mass amount of people who say they're pros and even the fact these big name tours the obscurity of fishing is still the obscurity of fishing, and we're still never going to get the time that we need. Bassmasters took a step in the right direction this year, getting on Fox Live. But even then, who's got... That's huge, though, it's man. Huge. That's so huge. But the problem is, the problem is the time of day that it's going to be airing. Right? Yeah. Like, if you were airing at 5 o'clock in the evening yes. until 8 o'clock in the evening i think you're gonna get way 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 more eyes amen and what's sad dude is like during the middle of summer 
what are you watching? Nothing. Yeah. You're not watching a sport, dude. You're not watching any sport. If you could figure out a way to get your tournaments to go until 8 p.m., it'd be amazing. Yeah, that and it's that's why MLF is so. Yeah, it's why MLF is so successful. Yes, dude. Those afternoon tournaments for me were one of the the coolest things that they ever did. When they didn't let them boys out to nine o'clock, you know what I mean, like or ten o'clock, and they had to fish in the afternoon. They did that, dude. That was some of the coolest crap because it's more realistic to me. You get off work about, you know, say you get off work early one day, you get on like about one, you fish from one till dark. You know, it's springtime, dude. That's awesome. You know what I mean? That's like, like like real fishing to me. And I don't know. I don't want to, I don't want to beat a dead horse. I mean, we've talked about all this crap before, but uh, the value add to me is just, it's just not there anymore. I mean, if I was a company looking to invest into something, a pros wrap or a promotional spot would be the last thing that I would look into unless it was somebody like a Hunter Shyrock or Brandon Polinick, these dudes who are being super successful on social media and building a brand a, around what they're doing and taking the Gary V approach. They're building a brand around themselves and they're getting people to invest into them individually. That's where I you're think that's one of the coolest things about old school ML or old school FLW is they built brands around like the family of pros. So you had like your Chevy team and you always knew who you're on, who's on your Chevy team and like mm -hmm. your Brian thrift. But Bass has always done a phenomenal job of like marketing certain pros, not their entire staff, not the entire list, but like certain pros like Ike built his name on it. Bass, uh, mm -hmm. KVD, G man, Skeet Reese. Like you have these huge personalities that Bass built. Mm -hmm. Hate to say that, but Bass really built these dudes and their mm -hmm. ability on the water. But mm -hmm. anyways, dude, let's let's hop off of pro fishing. Let's kind of get some people uh, coming over here in the comment section. Hit us up with some questions if you guys want to hear us talk about anything. Um, because I feel like we're beating a dead horse. And I just want to say, dude, Brandon Pollock. Gotta beat that dead the other horse day. down. Dude, Brandon Pollock is absolutely an insane hammer. Two tournament wins yeah. this year. Yeah, he's a good dude. He's I. I, I, I commented on an Instagram post of his earlier this year, and I said, and this is the God honest truth, I don't invest into individual anglers. I invest into the sport of fishing, but I'm very, very interested to see how he does this year. And he did well. I, I think it was that second year he got his he got his wheels under him, and he just he rolled with it. You know what I mean? He's doing very, very well, and I'm very impressed. Um, I may have lost Ben. Ben, are you still there? He is there. He's back. Yeah, He's I'm back. Doing... I'm back. I just moved the computer so, a little bit. Yeah, but anyway, so whatever. Yeah, so let's uh, let's talk more winter fishing stuff. That's what we're here for. We're talking about winter fishing, and but like I say, you know, you never know what kind of freaking rabbit hole I'm gonna go down. Oh, um. So yeah, any winter fishing questions? Please go let them know over in the uh, or let me know over in the comment section ben's kind of he's kind of moderating just a little bit and are trying to moderate as best yeah as i can. tried to moderate just because i feel like we got down like so far down a rabbit hole that i know you and i could have conversation but i don't want to say something stupid like i've said in the past, so I, figured, I figured we'd bounce away from the pro fishing and uh start to bounce back into things that are really on my avenue yeah, I love I love saying stupid stuff though. It's one of my favorite things to say because I'll say something stupid, I'll stand by it. Don't bother me none. Um, so, I mean, I've, st I've stood by some dumb stuff that I've said on these podcasts in the past. Some dumb ass stuff, <laughs> boy. I tell you what, hey, I've um, said some for stuff that I'm like, ooh, pull that podcast so that down. <laughs> Whoa, now you got to edit that part out there, boys. Hey, for everybody that doesn't know, Tyler Anderson is going to um, box KSI um, or whatever the crap that guy's name is, the guy that Logan Paul fought um, because he's because he's hitting on his girlfriend or something. I'm not sure. I didn't get the full story, um, but they're fighting tomorrow at three o'clock. Uh, you'll be able to view it on Tyler's channel, so go check that out. Um, we'll also be live streaming on Ben's channel. He'll be doing some stripping beforehand. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> but any, any, anyway, winter fishing, murky water. Um, you guys mentioned chrome baits can be strong. So let's talk about like murky to dirty water fishing in the winter. Like what am, what are you focusing on, Ben? Like what do you, when you think about like dirty water fishing, I know you do some pretty crazy things with your blade baits and you start focusing on certain colors more than others. Tell me about that. 
Sorry, or, I was or, really caught up in this. Co- I was oh, really caught up in this comment section. Dude, this comment section is going crazy over here. Hey, I love it. Um, hey, everybody that's here, since everybody's so invested into the podcast and into the live stream, and I've just rustled everybody's feathers like I like to do, go over there, hit that like button. There's 101 of you guys. Hit the like button. Let's get this thing rolling. Get it up to the top. I really do appreciate it. So, yeah, that's that. And go on and talk about your blade baits. Dude, blade baits are fun. But... One of the hardest things about blades, especially fishing in like really cold water, is when you have grass present, Mm -hmm. you can't fish a blade bait. So we've been learning some other techniques. You know, those baby tubes, like a little crappie style tube, like a two and a Mm -hmm. half inch tube, crushing smallmouth on that. Um, Ned rigs, like the cross style Ned rigs, crushing crushing fish on that too. But. Mm Yeah, playing around with some different things. But, like, when water gets murky, you take a blade and you fish, like, a really bright color. You fish a chartreuse or a white, something that contrasts a lot. You can get a lot of bites that way, too. Yeah, I agree with Ben. I'm, you know, I'm going to start focusing on things. When it gets murky, it gets, you know, a little bit colder. The water gets a little bit dirtier. Uh, you know, on bright, sunny days, I focus on, like, a chrome, right? That chrome is going to have a lot of flash. Yeah. And even in dirty water, that sun's going to be able to penetrate. It's going to create a flash that looks like a bait fish. You're going to be able to get a bite. Um, chrome and blue, chrome and chartreuse, chrome and red, chrome and pink, some kind of chrome with a peekaboo. On those more cloudy, overcast kind of days, I'm going to go with more opaque or like bright orange, crawl, red kind of colors, right? Do something that contrasts water really, really well, and but it still gives you that flash of a color to get those fish to react. So, I mean, it's just focus on contrasting the water color. I mean, that's all you got to do is just contrast that watercolor. All right, so old bass and beer. My buddy Josh over here has got a question about the Great Lake Chihuahua, which I'm going to miss that term, and it really, really sucks because I was really, really looking forward to it. Um, but he said gold when talking about Chihuahua. Could it be because of all the perch? I, you know, man, I, I I don't know. I don't know what kind of freaking bait fish live in that place. I know there's a lot of perch. I actually, so hey Ben, have you ever seen perch breach like jump a lot? Do you, can you explain that to me, or is that something your perch don't do? No, I, I have no idea what you're talking about. So so I've seen this a lot. I've seen it on all the lakes that have perch in me around here. When the perch are like really, really like on and like, you know, they're on because I'll be cranking and I'll catch 20 perch in a day cranking a crankbait. I'll catch almost as many perch as I do as a bass. But like they'll just jump out of the water like randomly, like nothing's chasing them. It's not like fish are blowing up on them. They'll just jump out of the water and they'll, come back down the water i i've never seen it before but that's the only thing that i saw on chihuahua is i saw perch jump out of the water and go back in i never saw a bait fish i never saw a bluegill um i've f- mainly focused on the largemouth bite i know there's a good smallmouth bite up there out deep doing some of that dropping stuff like that we were talking about but uh, dude like I'm just not going to go do that, especially not in a kayak, but I guess the gold has to do with the perch. I'm not really sure. That place is probably one of the weirdest things that I've ever seen in the whole entire world. There's grass up there that I've never seen anywhere else. It's the way the lake sits up. I've never seen it anywhere else. It's a crazy place, so I'm not sure. Yeah, dude, so like, I will say a lot of the lakes that have perch up here, a gold blade is phenomenal, but what I found interesting is like we have a lot of goby up north, if I throw a gold blade in a goby infested body of water, I struggle to get bit, which is odd because like gobies are typically browns and gold and have like these, you know, darker tones to them. But like anywhere that they're perch, gold is a phenomenal color. Um, but I don't know. I don't know. I've never fished Chowley. Yeah, I, I've only fished it two times, two times ever. So interesting place. Let's talk Alabama rigs. I know you like to throw them. I like I to throw them. I would like to say that I know a lot about them. I don't know much about them. So you get to take I, this one. I mean, I wouldn't say I know a ton about them. I, I have experience with them. I mean, I've caught a lot of big freaking fish on Alabama rigs. Um, one thing about an Alabama rig that I've noticed is I love smaller Alabama rigs. Um, it's something that I experimented with a lot. Very light wire, small Alabama rigs. Main reason is because I can fish them shallow and I can fish them fast. It's almost like fishing a spinnerbait. Um, and so I'll fish these smaller Alabama rigs with really light heads. And that way I can throw them up in two foot of water and roll them out because there's a lot of those big fish that'll live up shallow in the rocks and stuff. 
that you can't get them to react to a crankbait or anything else. But if you have that smaller, more compact Alabama rig, you still get that drawing power and that just crazy water displacement that Alabama rig has. But you can also just get absolutely obliterated up shallow still with an Alabama rig. So I like them. If you're fishing them from the bank, get a really small lot Alabama rig and just try it. I mean, there's a lot of companies making them. Well, that's what's really interesting is that uh, Dirds fished a very, very light Alabama rig this summer and was fishing it just like you mentioned, like a spinner rate. Bobby! Bobby! Bobby. Hey, <laughs> but yeah, he was fishing like a with 16th ounce heads in really shallow water, like a spinner bait. And that's a cool presentation because you see this big bait, like big school of baits coming through shallow water situations. He got a lot of bites on it. Yeah. And I mean, dude, it is. I mean, like, I think figuring out how to fish a lighter Alabama rig in shallow water could be a absolute killer. And Caleb Bell was the one who taught me about it. Like, I have to give him all the credit on fishing Alabama rig shallow. He was experimenting with a lot of different Alabama rigs, and he figured out some rigs that were still bulky and, and put off a lot of water, but you could still fish them shallow in the grass, and you'd rip them out of the grass real hard. And, I mean, dude, just straight getting stroked on them where a spinnerbait wouldn't work. You know what I mean? So, Dude, Bobby, I got I to gotta say, Bobby looks like he's been through hell and back, dude. He looks yeah. like he's <laughs> been to, like, jail. He's like, shanks him to beat his way out of there. I mean, he's, you know, Bobby's a rough one. Yeah, Bobby's a rough one. He had a little bit of a rough life. How old is Bobby? How old is Bobby? How old is Bobby? Two? Like, maybe two now. I don't know. We got him. We got him from, we call him Mean Man Jim. We don't actually know if the guy's name was Jim, but we call him Mean Man Jim because he lived with somebody that just called him Dog before we got him. That was Bobby's name was Dog. And so we got old Bobbery and he loves his mama. That's what he's wanting. He's wanting his mom because he's yeah. Bethany. Well, because you treat him buddy. terrible, dude. You, you just always pick on him and give him a hard time. But you love Bexley, so I got to give you that. Uh, Bexley's all right. She's uh, she's our special. She's our special. Bexley's dog. like Lily, dude. Bexley and Lily are the same. She's yeah, yeah. They're they're interesting to say the least. They're interesting to say the least. All right. So, Ben, what's your thought on spotter style soft plastic baits for smallmouth? I, have I don't no have an like. an, I don't have an answer for that question. Um, I've never fished it. I feel like that's like. Don't take this the wrong way. I feel like that's like a super old school way to fish though. Spider soft plastic is basically a soft plastic bait with like a built in skirt on it. And then like a grub coming off the back. I've never fished it. I mean, I know guys catch fish on it, but I, I uh, I've never, Nedrig you know, has basically replaced it. Small I never seen, basically replaced it. I ain't never seen two pretty best friends. <laughs> I was thinking that dude, like, yeah, this, yeah. We watched I mean, too not. much TikTok. We watched some stupid dude TikTok. I've been on the TikTok grind lately. I was walking around singing TikTok songs the other day, and it was not good. But yeah, that was the first thing that came to my mind. Is I, you know, I ain't never seen two pretty, pretty best what's, friends. What's your favorite TikTok trend currently? Do you have one? No, I don't have a favorite trend. Um, there's yeah, this Alex thing. can't mention it because. <laughs> Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm sure it's something just absolutely atrociously awful. No, there's this video going around right now on TikTok of this kid just absolutely waylaying this golf ball and hitting this dog with it. And for some reason, it just hits my funny bone. <laughs> and dude, That's I mean, like, I, I lied in bed the other night and cried. I laughed so hard at this stupid video. It was just ridiculous. It's stupid. I, I like stupid humor. You know what I mean? I like stupid yep. humor. So, but... Well, I tell you what, boys and girls, it's uh, it's been a fun hour and eight minutes here, but I'll be totally honest. There's a point at which I start sweating because my leg starts hurting. And so, yeah, it hurts. Like, it hurts bad, and it makes me sweat because it just hurts. I don't know. If you've ever been in that much pain before, it's not fun. I keep a smile on my face because I'm a tough son of a bitch. I'm just telling you, you ever shoot me, you better kill me because if I can get back up, I'm, I'm going to kill you. Get my hands on you. Um, so I think we're going to start back up. I'm going to start sweating and then I'm going to start, gonna start sweating. I'm going to get sweaty palms. Um, so here's the deal. Give us one more saucy question. Give us one more saucy question. And I think we're going to end tonight's podcast from here. So saucy questions only as my buddy Tyler would say. I got a saucy question for Tyler. If he's on here. Oh yeah. What is the saustiest question you've ever received in, in your 
in your messages asking for saucy questions. Yeah, I would like to know that. What is the sauciest? Because Tyler sauce? asks, Tyler always asks for saucy questions. And he always answers ones that are kind of saucy. Yeah, I worry about some of the actual sauce that he gets. I know he has to get some. Oh, he has to get some. Just, I mean, I know the kind of crap people sends me. You know, like, and you're like, what? Where did this even come from? Like, so I, I, I don't even ask it. for saucy questions. I'm oh, just like, hey, spicy questions. Excuse me, we we're saying it wrong. Spicy, saucy, whatever. It's all the same crap spicy then sorry tyler with your spicy questions i can i can hear him saying it like that too for some reason poor kid all right so spicy questions spicy by the way questions. tyler tyler is awesome like we give tyler some crap but tyler is awesome see you always gotta back everything up with like oh but we really like tyler i do like tyler real. i don't want anybody to know that though i want everybody to think that like i really don't like him so that we can start some crap that doesn't actually exist i've always thought about this dude i'm always like man what if we start some like fake beef? I don't know. I'll start fake beef. I'll start. Fa I'll start fake beef with Chad Hoover right now. I don't like him <laughs> and he stinks. Okay, he's in here right now. I'm starting fake beef. All right. Oh, all right. So uh, let's see. Is this a spicy question? If you smash them one day on the three XD in the rock collar and you can't get bit the next day with the similar conditions, how do you make yourself put down what you're gonna throw? I don't. I just don't I know. I, I suck so bad, dude. I'm so bad. That's why I could never be professional. That's why I could never be a good long-term fisherman. Because I'm like stuck in my own head. I'm like, nope, they're gonna bite it again. Yep. Piss on them if they don't. Like it's I, I mean it's I like it's like sunny and bluebird skies one day and the next is raining and overcast and nasty. They're gonna bite it yeah. again. Yeah. Yeah, they're gonna do it again. I don't care. I don't care what anybody says. I'm I'm gonna press pressure those bass and I'm gonna pry their mouth open and stick it in there. Oh god. I have a I, okay, I have a real saucy question. You could mm -hmm. fight one fishing YouTuber. <laughs> Fucking fine. Okay. I'm sorry, go ahead. Or actually, actually, not a fishing YouTuber, a professional fisherman. We're if going like the Jake Paul versus Nate Richardson, whoever he just fought, we're doing that mm -hmm. kind of thing. But you got to fish a, or fight a professional fisherman. I don't know. <laughs> like who, who who am I going to throw paws with as a professional fisherman? I don't know. Do I get to use a weapon or is it just like bare knuckle boxing? No, it's boxing. Like normal boxing with gloves or bare knuckle? Yeah, like Jake Paul just beat the like, crap I, out of that guy. Like, am I going to hurt this guy or are we just going to have like No, a, you're a not going to hurt anybody, obviously. Okay, well, um, I honestly, I don't know. Um, Cody Meyer, I don't like his face. <laughs> Dude, that's that's actually really funny. We've had conversations like how we changed from year to year. We're like, is this the same person? It's not the same person. Someone, they're, close. they're totally did someone, cloning him. Did someone they're like totally put on his jersey and just take a picture? They're they're Star Wars cloning him, like for sure. Like it's I don't not know how that person. happened. It did not look like the same human being. No, Cody I Meyer wish is I like a phenomenal had... long term fisherman, and like yes, the yes. person that wore his jersey was not him. No, it wasn't. I sent you the picture. I yeah, sent you the picture. Like, it, that... it was a different human. It was. A I was like, I don't know. <laughs> Dude, it was. It was. And I, I wish like, I could show you guys. That was hilarious. I know. Did we still got that? Was that in a text message? Or did I send yeah, you that it was on in Instagram? A text message, I'm pretty sure. Dude, and maybe I was, swear maybe to God, it was if that was, was Cody Meyer, <laughs> if, that, if that was Cody Meyer, they did some god awful photoshopping to the poor guy. I mean, that was not the same human being. All right, that's why I say I don't like his face. Is because whatever that was that day was not him. Poor dude. Because I oh, met yeah. the guy. Like it was not him. So mm -hmm. there you go. There's your, there's your know, that's, that's funny. That's a great answer. I think that's the way we should end it. I do too. And you know, Chad's going to fight Fluke Master. I'm going to fight Cody Meyer. Ben, we'll get you some short guy to fight because we got to get you somewhere in your weight class. But yeah. I mean, weight class, I'd have to fight like a six foot dude, but like <laughs> hot height class. class. We got to get a hot class. Yeah. All right, boys and girls, there you go. That's that. That's that's how we do live streams and podcasts when me and Ben get on here. You know, any other person would probably be semi-professional and like whatever. Not me and Ben. We just make crap up. We hang out and we let Bobby on here. We let baby Reese on here. My wife's standing here. I mean, I got a broke leg. It's just, it's a great day to be alive and, and just, it's great. And I want to thank Ben for hanging out with me. I want to thank all the people for coming in and hanging out with me. If everybody would, 
go hit that uh that like button for me. It'll really help me out. I'd fight Naughty up north. Dude, I, I was thinking that. I was thinking about like, like the Vanderbilt kicker thing. I'm yes. Like, oh, I'd totally fight. Oh, I, dude. I'd I own totally, her. Yeah, I don't care. Yeah. She's taller than me, but I'd totally fight her. Cage match. Like, old oh, dude, you know what I miss before we end this? Before we end this, and this is a TikTok trend that I'm on right now, is people posting old WWE footage from back like in the good old days. I'm talking yeah, like with Sting and Scott Steiner yes. and the Steiner brothers and yes. oh, dude, yeah, that was a, and then you start rolling WWE with, was good, dude. Yes, I dude, I miss that crap. That was like some of the funnest time that I can remember as a kid is watching wrestling, dude. I got a I got a crazy story for you before we go. My mom dated okay. one of the Steiner brothers because the Steiner no. brothers went to Bay City Western and they were in my mom's grade. And my mom dated one of the Steiner brothers, not not Scotty Steiner, the one like the. One more not time, that what was one. that? Okay, there you go. Not that one. The other. Okay. One. Can I say it one more time? Yeah, maybe he went like this. Okay, and he had like that... the chains on his arm and the white, oh, white hair. Yeah. Not that one. The other, that, the that, other, the other one. Brother. You want to know a fun fact about Knoxville, Tennessee? Yeah. You want to know who our mayor is? Who? Kane. Oh, you our, told me this. Our you mayor is Kane. This. Yes, yes. Our mayor is Kane. What's his real name? Glenn Jacobs. Glenn Jacobs. I voted Dude, for him. All right, he's I awesome. Would love, Libertarian, I, would, I love him. I would love, I would love. Guys, please go onto Morgan Wallen's page and tell Morgan Wallen to come fish with Alex Rudd. I would love that. He's dude. He's like down the road from you. Or who's yeah. the guy from like Weezer? Is it Weezer? Yeah, he. They're from Knoxville too. Yeah, I'm down with them. Guys ain't gonna go fishing. I could probably the dude from. <laughs> I would. I would much rather go fishing with Morgan Wallen than the dudes from Weezer. Even though I like Weezer's music a lot more than Morgan Wallen, I, I feel like me and Morgan Wallen would get along. The dudes from Weezer, I feel like we would get in a fight about like gun control or something. But anyway. Remember, folks, gun control is keeping your finger off the trigger until you decide to kill something. This has been another Alex Rowe Fishing Podcast, (laughs) and you guys are sweet. And uh, we'll see you next time. Bye. Thanks for watching.